Welcome to Baseball Seasons 1980 Hot Corner Champions. Every World Series showcases the best baseball has to offer. The 1980 Fall Classic was no different, featuring two of the greatest third basemen of all time at the height of their powers. The pitch to Schmidt. Long drive, he buried it! He buried it! Unbelievable! George Brett, the Kansas City franchise. He really woke up America going for 400. While both of these future Hall of Famers possessed awards and accolades, one common goal eluded them both, a world championship. In 1980, something had to give. If we get in the habit to bust our ass out of home plate and run the first, even if we're out, it sets a pattern for the Phillies of 1980. And while springtime usually ensures optimism throughout baseball, in Clearwater, Florida in 80, there was a far more ominous climate. In the mid-70s, we had a tough time closing the deal in the National League Championship Series. Griffey swings, slow shot for right side. Here comes Concepcion, and the 1976 credit belongs to the Reds. The city was just starved for uh, winning baseball. And this ball is trapped by Luzinski. It's a double for Matty Mota. We lost the National League Championship three years in a row. And this That team had had so much disappointment, and the fans were getting tired of them not being able to succeed. Show! You guys, show! They needed to get to the World Series that year because they had the disappointments in 76, 77, 78. This year, there's probably more pressure on our ball club than ever because we've been told by the front office that if they don't do it this year, they're going to have to break up the ball club. A year earlier, free agent Pete Rose had been brought in. I know when we played them in 76, they had a lead against us in a couple of the games in the playoffs. They just lacked that killer instinct. Despite Pete's 331 average in 79, the three-time defending NL East champs finished a disappointing fourth, prompting another move. At the end of the season, they fired Danny Ozark, and they brought in Dallas Green to evaluate the team the last month of the season. All the club really loved Danny Ozark. They didn't care for Dallas Green at all. No, I'm not going to make you hit and run all the time, sweetheart. I made things a little tough for him. Dallas looked at that group and thought they were way too comfortable, way too satisfied for a team that had never won a postseason series. And that's what he set out to change. Like the Phillies, perennial playoff failures seem to be haunting the Kansas City Royals. Always a bridesmaid, never a bride, I guess. From 1976 to 78, the Royals were ALCS participants. It was kind of like David and Goliath, as far as small market Kansas City against the big bad Yankees. Chris Jambliss has won the American League pennant for the New York Yankees. I was irritated because I knew that we weren't that far away. The Yankees win the American League pennant, and with their joy, Patek is down along the first baseline. They beat us all three times, and so by 1980, it was a big rivalry. They didn't like us, we didn't like them. So the overriding mantra of the Royals' spring was quite similar to that of the Phillies, a need to clear their respective hurdles. We knew to get the respect we needed as an organization, it, sooner or later we had to beat the Yankees. Feeling a need for more pop in their lineup, Casey traded for Angel slugger Willie Mays Aikens. And in another parallel to the Phillies' fine-tuning, the Royals replaced manager Whitey Herzog with rookie manager Jim Fry. We're looking forward to playing under Jim Fry. He knows the game. He's been in the game a long time. So we won a championship in Kansas City. If the Royals were to improve on their second place 79 finish and perhaps get to a World Series, they'd need George Brett to continue to carry them on his back. A challenge he appeared ready to tackle. I would like to start the season hot and end it hot and see what kind of year I could put together. You always read about the Jim Rices and the Fred Lins and the Rod Carews, which is great. They're great ball players, but someday I'd like to pick up a paper and read about George Brett. For Brett and the Royals to make the World Series, they would need to decode the secret of the defending AL champion success. Excuse me, you guys want to get over there, please? In 79, we went to the World Series, lost to the We Are Family Pirates. And so coming into 1980, we felt pretty good about ourselves as a team. And why not? Winners of 102 games in 79 
the O's were returning a combined 60 homers and 210 RBIs from their switch-hitting power tandem of Ken Singleton and Eddie Murray. I can't remember any more powerful switch-hitting combinations than Kenny Singleton and Eddie Murray. As usual, the Orioles had top-shelf pitching, which included the winningest pitcher of the 70s, Jim Palmer, and 1979's Cy Young Award winner, Mike Flanagan. The Orioles will be there. The Orioles are uh, winning tradition. So as the 80 season was set to begin, Earl Weaver's checklist for success was punched. Earl loved the three-run home run, and we had guys that could hit three-run home runs. We had pitchers that could pitch complete games, and Earl was smart enough to realize he had a really well-rounded ball club. In stark contrast, the 80 Yankees appeared vulnerable. Coming off a subpar fourth-place finish, the Yankees had to replace their catcher and captain Thurman Munson, whose death the previous summer had shocked baseball. We thought we could come back in 79 like we did in 78, and then when that happened, we couldn't make a comeback like we had planned on doing, but it just, it was devastating. Coming over in an off-season trade with Toronto, young catcher Rick Cerrone sensed the void would be tough to fill. I hope people don't think I can step right in and replace people that have been there. I'm not capable of doing that right yet. I'm 25, and I think I'm still improving. Reggie Jackson was looking to improve on his 29 homers and 89 RBIs in 79, both team highs. And with new manager Dick Hauser providing stability after the Billy Martin, Bob Lemon merry-go-round, the Yanks hoped to give the O's a run for their money in 80. How many people went out to see my sign out there, the billboard? The buck skipper fired a spring salvo at those hoping to dethrone his world champion pirates. They say, uneasy lies the man that wears the crown. Well, I always say, uneasy lies the man that tries to catch the man that wears the crown. Just like the 70s, the 1980s version of the Bucks also looked to be lumber company scary. Madlock, Easler, Parker, and the heart of it, and Pops, okay, he's 40 years old, but he also swung a 40-ounce bat, so you had to honor that. The rest of the division was hoping that the family had indeed aged and was now ready for the taking. We knew that the club was getting older. Obviously, Willie was getting older. Come on, Will! But when you're coming off a World Series championship, you're going to try to make another run, and that's what we thought we were going to do. That's all. 30 games over 579, the youthful Expos finished two games behind the world champion Pirates, making a strong statement as an up-and-coming team. By 1979, we had become a contending team, primarily because of everyone coming together that had started in the minor league system. Steve Rogers, Gary Carter, Andre Dawson, Ellis Valentine, and Larry Parrish made for an explosive and formidable core. Uh, they know we're coming. And looking at the division, tight as it's going to be, we figured to be right in it to the last day again this year. After missing the playoffs in 79 by a game and a half, the Houston Astros were not on the fence concerning expectations for 1980. We're not here to win the pennant, we're here to win the World Series. Going in, we felt like we had a chance. They had made a couple additions that uh, had made us a little deeper. One such change was free agent Joe Morgan, highly credentialed with two MVP awards and World Series rings with the Big Red Machine. We hadn't won, and Joe was a proven winner. I think more than anything, he brought the winning way to our ball club. While the Morgan signing added stability, the addition of Nolan Ryan as the first ever million dollar a year player brought big time credibility to the emerging Astros. Put him with J.R. Richards, you got two of the best throwers in the business. J.R. along with Nolan Ryan were the two great power pitchers in Major League Baseball, and J.R. might have had the larger fear factor Coming off four consecutive seasons of at least 18 wins and two straight years with more than 300 strikeouts, Richard indeed cast a long shadow. When I'm out there, it's my turn. I'm going out there to win. I think I would have struck out 300 batters next four or five years because I was increasingly getting better. My control was getting better, and I was learning how to pitch a lot better. With 21-game winner Joe Necro and his knuckleball between flamethrowers Richard and Ryan, the Astros' starting pitching appeared to be top flight. L.A. was coming off an uncharacteristic subpar season as they finished 11 and a half games off the NL West pace. That didn't sit well with the Dodgers. 
I'm looking forward to 1980. I want to dismiss 79 from my mind and my memory. The Dodgers were hopeful that their tenured infield of Steve Garvey, Davey Lopes, Bill Russell and Ron Say, now entering their seventh straight full year together, would anchor another drive to the pennant. The one thing I remember from 1918 was an extraordinarily talented team with a great blend of veterans with a lot of young talent coming in. Of that young talent, 22-year-old reliever Steve Howe stood out the most due to his electrifying stuff. Steve came from double-A baseball in 1979 to spring training, and I don't think anyone hit a loud foul ball off him in spring training. It was unbelievable. Howe jumped out of the gate with a win and three saves in April on his way to an eventual Rookie of the Year award. But that performance paled in comparison to what J.R. Richards' opening month would produce. When we faced the Dodgers and J.R. was pitching, we knew it was going to be an easy game for him because Tommy kept all those right-handers in the lineup, and it was like a hot knife going through butter. He threw a one-hitter at him one time. The one-hitter was Richard's second April win versus L.A. For the month, he had 48 strikeouts in just 37 and two-thirds innings. He was on track to have his best season yet, which is really saying something. Another pitcher making a loud statement was the Phillies' Steve Carlton. When your ace, your horse, your number one starter is on the mound, everybody feels good about winning. May of 80 had many winning days for Carlton as he went 6-1 for the month to up his record to 9-2, a mark that ballooned to 14-4 by the All-Star break. Joining him on the pitching staff was the team's emotional leader and relief ace, Tug McGraw. He would hit his heart with his glove and smile, and he had a twinkle in his eye, and he was very successful. Success was contagious in 80, and Mike Schmidt found a way to take his punishing offense to yet another level. That was the point after about seven years in the league that Mike became actually a good hitter, understanding his strengths, not just the home runs. May was especially sweet for Mike Schmidt. 12 homers and 29 RBIs to give him the Major League lead. Despite the individual efforts, the Phils trailed the Pirates at the end of May by a game in a division that would go down to the wire. As the calendar flipped from May to June in the American League West, the Royals were having a great year as they were on a fast track to success. We utilized our ballpark tremendously with the doubles, the triples, so we were never a power team because of Kauffman Stadium. It was critical for us to have a lot of jackrabbits. The first guy, you know, was Willie Wilson, who was uh, the fastest guy in baseball. Known as one of the game's most disruptive base runners, Wilson would go on to steal 79 bags in 80, while leading the league in hits, triples, and runs scored. Willie was the person that set the table for us. And the job of closing out the opposition went to Dan Quisenberry, an emerging star in just his first full season. He's the big man out of the bullpen for these Royals, and his fans react. But as great as Quiz's year was, it was a teammate who was having a season for the ages. I kept telling myself that I was the best player in the game, even though I wasn't, but I tried to convince myself that I was. Following a lackluster April, Brett batted 329 in May. And in nine games in June, before suffering a leg injury, Brett foreshadowed a memorable summer by hitting 472. A two run pass with two outs in the ninth inning, and George Brett has broken the three free tie. He was our club. You know, we lived and died by George. So, not coincidentally, after Brett warmed with the weather, the Royals had opened an eight game lead by the end of June. As baseball paused for its midsummer classic, the eyes of the nation focused on the game's most dominant pitcher. From the Houston Astros, J.R. Richard. Richard. He was the best pitcher in both leagues at that time. J.R. Richard warmed up at about 95 miles an hour. Big kick. Whoa, what a bullet. The radar guns at all-star time had him up over 100 miles an hour. The pitch to fist, gone. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was a fastball at better than 100 miles an hour. JR just lit up the guns. He lit up the world of everything going on Major League Baseball-wise at the time. When I went out there, a little jittery, first time being in the All-Star <laughs> game, then I began to relax as the game progressed, and I felt a lot better. The fact that JR felt good after his All-Star appearance added more uncertainty to Richard's earlier claims of not feeling well physically. 
He has been experiencing stiffness in his right forearm. He uses the word fatigue to describe it. Around May, he started mentioning that his arm was starting to feel dead and he was losing the feeling of the ball in his hand at times. Beginning in mid-June, Richard began pulling himself out of games with varying complaints, leading to some lingering questions. People were saying that he was jaking on us, but I knew JR wanted to be a big part of our winning. I'm sure he wanted to be out there for us, and it was a shame to see what happened. JR made his next and what proved to be his final start of 1980, six days after the All-Star game. He exited in the fourth inning, and two days later joined the disabled list with a tired arm said to myself, what is wrong? What is wrong? So I just continued to throw the ball and it just kept getting increasingly worse. On July 30th, while testing his condition, J.R. Richard collapsed, suffering a life-threatening stroke. It was just devastating to the team. Everybody thought the world of J.R. He was our ace and we just felt it was a dagger to the heart. At the All-Star break, the Yankees possessed baseball's best record. That really felt good because it really got us back to getting a chance to be the team that we were put together to be. New York's seven and a half game lead had their fans thinking postseason once again. To open up a lead like we did, um, you know, everything was clicking. Replacing Munson, Rick Cerrone surprised with season ending numbers of 14 homers and 85 RBIs. Being on a pennant contender like the Yankees has probably made me have a better year. Having his best year as a Yankee, Reggie Jackson put up gaudy numbers. Reggie was a great leader, you know. Reggie came out there and Reggie played the whole year, all the way out. Even when he was hurt, he played. Jackson's 41 homers and 111 RBIs in 80 were both his season highs as a Yankee. I believe Reg was locked in as well as a hitter could be. That made the Yankees the team that they've always been. It seemed as if the fourth place Orioles had little chance to catch the Yanks as they trailed by nine games at the All-Star break. We were as far back as 11 games end of July, and we had eight games to play with them in a fairly short period of time, a three-game series in their ballpark and a five-game series in our ballpark. Beginning August 8th, the now scorching Orioles were hoping for a sweep in the Bronx. Came in five games out in the loss column. It could be a disastrous situation. Mission accomplished as the O's swept the Yanks in the Bronx, highlighted by one of Steve Stone's league-leading 25 wins, which earned him his sole Cy Young Award. The Orioles are a team that notoriously has not beaten themselves, so it certainly helped my performance to be with this club. When the scene shifted to Baltimore four days later, the O's crept closer to the sputtering Yanks, taking three of five at home, further shrinking the deficit to two and a half games. When you're a championship team and you go out there knowing what your responsibilities are, somewhere along the line, it's all gonna kick in. The Orioles would win 100 games. We wound up closing that gap to a half game. That got our attention. And never got any closer that year. So when Goose Gossage closed out Detroit for Yankee win number 102, the Yanks were division champs. This guy makes consistent contact as well as anybody. I know that he is capable of hitting somewhere around 400, maybe over 400. Could George Brett become the first player in nearly four decades to hit 400 in a single season? That was the question consuming baseball throughout the summer of 80. How about that George Brett? This man has gotten more hits since the All-Star break than a lot of players will get all season. <laughs> Everything he swung at, he hit. His batting average since the All-Star break, 520. Here's the man, George Brett. He was a superman. The big story in baseball this week, George Brett. He continues his quest for 400. He's now batting 404. From June on, Brett never dipped below 300. But when he returned from injury after the All-Star break and hit 494 in July, his assault began. Brett now is hit safely in 14 ball games. My mind was in the game, was very sharp, I was very confident. Obviously, I was doing a lot of things right fundamentally. There it goes, way back, he teed up on that one. One of the most consistent, with damage, done seasons I've seen from an offensive standpoint. This ball is well hit, it is going, it is gone. Beginning July 18th, Brett ripped off a 30-game hitting streak, which included 18 multi-hit games. 
The run lifted him over the 400 mark. I'd never hit over 333 in my life, and all of a sudden I'm at 400 with six weeks to go, so I didn't know what to expect. There was so much media attention and what ultimately became pressure for him from the media. With two weeks to go in the season and I'm still over 400, I did the one thing that I shouldn't have done. I went out and tried to hit 400. Despite the fact that Brett fell short in his quest to be the first since Ted Williams to eclipse 400, he was still the talk of the league. The fact that you can go through a full season, flirt with 400, and get there for a while, only to slip back to 390, he deserved to be the MVP that year. The best player on a team that won its division by a whopping 14 games. In the NL East, the world champion Pirates played the entire season wearing a bullseye on their back. I'm glad they're the champions of the world because they're in the Eastern Division of the National League and that makes what I think is the best division in baseball. When you go against the Pirates or the Phillies, the teams that you're contending with for the division title, you have to play them even up if not better. But if we're there in the end, you're going to have to take it from us because it's ours right now. Prophetic comments indeed, as proven by September 1st standings. Unfortunately for the aging Pirates, a 10-17 September knocked them from contention. We just couldn't finish the deal. Our tanks were empty on September 1st. As late as September 16th, the Expos were in first place by two and a half games. The question was, were the fighting Phils capable of fighting back? The 80 team really didn't love each other. The hitters didn't like the pitchers, pitchers didn't like the hitters. So it was kind of a bait and place in the clubhouse. And Dallas Green had a very firm hand. We had a lot of ups and downs in August, and Dallas read the riot act a few times during that six-week period. We still only got one hit, man. Let's go. I was irate because the guys really never bought into the fact that they had the talent, but they were talking the talk, and they just weren't walking the walk. I was convinced that unless something drastic happened, we were going to go back into the doldrums again. I wasn't about to let that happen. The fact that with a week to go in the season, Dallas Green could bench Greg Lazinski, Bob Boone, and Gary Maddox was incredible. I ain't got anybody. He was going to do whatever he felt he needed to do to win. Case in point was September call-up Marty Bystrom. Green started him five times and was rewarded as the rookie went 5-0 with a 1.50 ERA. He brought that to the table in September, and we would not have won without Marty Bystrom uh, pitching the way he pitched. The same could be said about Mike Schmidt. In August and September, he belted 17 homers, raising his total to 44, and fulfilling the expectations that Pete Rose had for him. He started talking about me as the greatest player he'd ever played against and with, because he knew that that made me feel like Superman. And the more he could make me feel like Superman, the better player I'd become, and obviously the better the team would become. As predicted all along, the NL East did come down to October. Expo number one! Yeah. A deciding series between the deadlock Phillies and Expos, winner take all. We felt like we had it where we needed it, that it was in our hands and it was in our park. The feeling that you have, it's almost like it's a World Series. You know that if you beat them two out of three games, you go on. For me, it was sort of a defining series in terms of playing under pressure and coming through. We went to Montreal to have to win these two games, and I went six for 11. Won the first game with a home run, won the second game with a home run. That game, the way they won that game. That is it. The Phillies have won the title. They came from behind twice in this ball game, and the Phillies are the East Division champions for 1980. The National League West saw the Astros and Dodgers battle into October. This has been such a tight one this year. Down to the wire where every game is a must-win situation. The Astros held a three-game lead on the Dodgers with the final three games of the year slated for Dodger Stadium. We knew it was going to be tough for us in L.A., but we didn't think that we could lose. Despite the odds, the playoff-tested Dodgers felt up to the task. 
Number one, we thought we were better than them in the first place. And number two, we had heard they had champagne on ice. They think they got this one already. And with Ken Forsh vying for a complete game two to one win, the Astros just about did. The Astros are two outs away from the National League West Championship. And Ken Forsh trying to finish them off. Little tapper, Ford Landis score. He's going to have to go to first. Bottles the ball and everybody's safe. Runners first and second with one out. One out later, in a do-or-die situation. Astros so close, they can taste it. Ron Say did. Ground ball, through into center field, and we have a tie game. Which opened the door for Joe Ferguson's 10th inning heroics. High fly ball, deep left center. Zedanio back to the warning track, and the race is still on. Once that game turned L.A.'s way, the momentum really started to build for the Dodgers, and you had the sense that these guys are not going to cough up a game. L.A. now had the momentum as they would sweep the three-game series. We actually had the lead in all three games, and it was kind of devastating. We had to play an extra game. Game 163. The fifth National League playoff ever did nothing to rattle the sliding Astros. Nuxy was our pitcher. We all felt great with Nuxy. He was going for number 20 that day. And for the second straight year, he got it. As Necro closed out the Dodgers with a 7-1 complete game win. Bouncing ball to the right side. Bergman has it, steps on first, and the Astros have won the National League West. The exulting Astros going on to Philadelphia. Somehow, the tension of the one-game playoff would simply serve as a prelude to the drama that would unfold in the National League Championship Series. The greatest confrontation in my life of watching sports was the uh, 1980 League Championship Series between the Phillies and Houston. Here comes Landis to score to throw way off the mark. The Astros win it. The best LCS of all time. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. One run, extra innings, back and forth. Four straight extra inning games with that pressure. In this crazy game, never give up. Houston Astros come back and look at this crowd. That whole series was exhausting. It was emotionally and physically exhausting just to watch it. Terry Poole, so consistent throughout this series. It was a knockdown, drag out series. They'll go to the stretcher and that will be all for Cedeno. A battle of wills. Who wanted it the most? The series began innocently enough as Houston earned a split in Philly, winning game two in extra innings. Coming home 1-1, one, one, and we felt like we were in a driver's seat. Joe Negro's 10 scoreless innings in game three paved the way for an Astros 1-0, 11-inning win. But Houston's euphoria was fleeting when game four swung Philly's way. In the 10th, Charlie Hustle, living up to his nickname, was hell-bent on breaking a three-all tie. Here comes Rose around third. It'll take a perfect play. The throw to the plate gets away from Mochi. Rose scores. If the series wasn't tight enough, decisive game five would be a real nail-biter. You see things sometimes that really can't happen, and then they happen. The way that game ended was one of those things. Let's see if there's any comeback now left in the fields. They have to do it against one of the great pitches. Down 5-2 to two in the eighth inning with Nolan Ryan on the mound. You're not supposed to win that game. Bottom of the order, Boa, Boone, and Gross. Pete Rose was right there next to me. He said, if you get on, we're going to win this game today. And it happened so fast. That's a little looper, and it's past Reynolds, and Boa's on. Bob Boone hit a ball back at Ryan that would have been a double play ball. Off the pitcher's glove, there'll be no play. Greg Gross bunted the first pitch. The bunt down the third baseline. And before you even turn around, we had the bases loaded and nobody out. We have seen everything in this series. I do not believe it. They rallied a little bit with him, and I thought he got a little bit tired. I ended up taking him out. That didn't work either. By now, in this classic, everyone expected an Astros answer. It came in their next at bat. Seven sixes going out, both in the bottom of the eighth. Swing up base hit in the center. Here comes Cooley score. The game's tied. This is the best, the darndest baseball game ever played. As complex as this series was, it came down to Gary Maddox's 10th inning, two out, simplified approach to hitting. 
I had a reputation as a first ball hitter, so it was easy. Pitch came, was first pitch. I always swing at it, and I ended up hitting the line drive. And the drive goes center field. It's in for a base hit. Coming in to break the tie is Del Unser. The Phillies lead it 8-7. And when Maddox squeezed the final out of the scintillating series, one thing became quite clear in Philadelphia. They are not the same old Phillies. They are the 1980 Phillies. The ALCS mirrored its National League counterpart as one of its participants was haunted by the recent playoff failures they'd endured. Having lost to them in 76, 77, and 78, three great playoff series. Had we lost to them in 80 as well, yeah, there would have been a lot more what-ifs. And I'm not really sure either the Royals or their fans know that they can beat the Yankees. It was frustrating losing to the Yankees in 77. I thought our team was equivalent, if not better. And really, when we got to 1980, if nothing else, the odds were in our favor that we can win one out of four. It was a huge barrier to be broken by the Kansas City Royals and the organization. We needed to go outplay the New York Yankees. We needed to do it in their park as well as ours. And I knew in 1980 we were ready. If the NLCS was defined by intensity, the ALCS was rooted in animosity. Everybody had a rival, and Kansas City was ours at that time. Brett went in hard at Nettles, and Nettles kicked him, and that's when the fight started. I hate the Yankees. I still hate them. Then you know what? They still hate me. But Royals fans adored George, and Brett gave them renewed hope in game one with a familiar playoff occurrence. George Brett has just hit the fifth home run of his championship series career. A game one route, coupled with game two's three to two win, earned Royal reviews. But back in the Bronx, edginess prevailed. I really thought going back to Yankee Stadium, if we didn't win that game, it would really be tough to beat them. Trailing two to one in the seventh, Brett came to bat with two men on to face Yankee relief ace, Goose Gossage. Oh, here's the game on the line right now. I knew he was going to be throwing the ball 95 to 100 miles an hour. I just told myself, be quick, try to pull the ball, and if you get it in the air, it's a bonus. Set by Gossage, a high drive, and deep to right field. The noise of that bat meeting that ball was the loudest I've ever heard contact with a ball and bat in my whole life. And not only did I get it in the air, it was one of the farthest home runs I ever hit in my life. Three run home. You could have heard a pin drop, and it was just a neat feeling to know that uh, you were finally going to be in a World Series. Prisonberry, 3-2 pitch. A call, strike three. That's it. The Royals go to the World Series. That's the only time I've ever cried in baseball. We had finally beaten the Yankees, and that was a big relief for us. Nobody picked us to win our division. Nobody picked us to beat the Yankees. We surprised everybody again. What a year. So that made up for a lot of the pain, I think, from 76, 7, and 8. Oh, oh man. <laughs> The biggest thrill coming into that series was finally making it to the World Series. This actually is bigger for us, I think, than the bicentennial. Going into that World Series, we knew we had to win. But we also knew that the history of the Phillies was, you know, you can't win the big one. This town has been waiting for it a long time. Predictors had predicted us to win the World Series in six games. And I felt like we had the best team man for man. That advantage seemed evident in game one as the rested Royals started 20-game winner Dennis Leonard, while Philly's best Steve Carlton was being rested due to his LCS stint in Game 4. Right hand to walk delivers, and a breaking ball is whacked to left field. Lonnie Smith going back to the warning track, and it is gone. It wasn't Steve Carlton on the mound, it was Bob Walk. And I remember all the home runs flying out there, and I was going, you know, when's this going to stop? One ball and two strikes to Aiken. McRae does not go, and Aiken hits a high fly ball in the right center field. A way back, it's gone. Four to nothing Royals. But while the lead seemed daunting to their scarred fan base, these Phillies had a newfound confidence born during their dramatic NLCS. We were a good come from behind team. We knew uh, get a couple guys on. 2-2 two -two pitch is hit up the middle, and that'll be a base hit for Larry Boa. Steal a base. There goes Boa. The pitch is a strike, the throw down, he's stolen it. And that wakes up the crowd a little bit here in Philadelphia. Pop the ball of the ballpark, and we could catch him. Luzinski proved prophetic as the Phillies scored two runs and had two aboard. 
potential time run to run for Bates McBride, who's batting cleanup despite having hit only nine home runs the entire season. Every game is a big game, especially when you open a series at home. McBride's three-run homer puts the finishing touches on a five-run third, and the Phillies have catapulted into the lead. The Phillies extended the lead to three before Tug McGraw sealed a narrow victory. Two out in the ninth inning, Philadelphia seven, Kansas City six, and Tug McGraw working on Willie Wilson. Fastball got him swinging. And as they put up on the message board, the first World Series victory Game two will always be remembered for George Brett's most unusual ailment. His condition, well, he has a blockage of blood vessels forcing a protrusion of tissue from the rectum. In layman's language, he has hemorrhoids. Brett would still go two for two in an abbreviated stint, but for his team, the true burr in their saddle would be the never-say-die Phillies, who trailed four to two in the eighth. Quisenberry trying to nail it down for Kansas City. Quiz had been money closing all year long, so we were confident we'd win. Left center field, a base hit. Bob Booth digging hard. It'll be 4 3. High chopper, base hit. So we're all tied up. With the history of Dan Quisenberry and what he had done, you keep thinking he's going to get out of this. He's going to get a ground ball, we're going to get a double play, whatever. But it just didn't happen. The game is tied. Schmidt's double put the Phils up to stay, with their 6-4 win continuing a late game trend. It's a great feeling to have when you're down in a ball game to feel like five games in a row you've overcome the lead. Uh, uh, it's a real feeling of confidence. We've waited a long time, but it's worth the wait. This is about the greatest thing that ever happened to Kansas City, I'll tell you. While hosting their first ever World Series game was fun, narrowing the Philly lead was of greater importance. Willie Mays Aikens had even more incentive. My mom was up in the stands. It was the first time in my whole life that my mom had had a chance to see me play. Not only did her son respond with the first cripple of his career, but in extra innings, he gave mom a memory she'd never forget. single-handedly put us back into the World Series, one game down now, the dramatic walk-off. I mean, that's the thing kids dream about. If Aiken's Game 3 was a dream, then his Game 4 was definitely a recurring nightmare for Philly hurlers, beginning in the first. Then in the second, an Aiken's encore. I didn't like to watch home runs when they hit them off me, but he hit this one so far, I turned around and admired it. Well hit, keep the run, keep the run. Hitting like Willie Mays, Aiken's second homer of the day made the score five to one and helped the Royals even the series at two games apiece. KC fans flocked to 1980's final home game at Royals Stadium. Game five of a deadlocked World Series. We feel this is an important ball game, but we also feel that even if we lose, we're still going to win it because we got the best ball club. 18 game winner Larry Gura's resume figured to trump that of Philly's September call up Marty Bystrom. Surprisingly, though, experience flinched first. One out, no score, we're in the fourth. Well hit, center field. Otis is going back near the warning track. It is a home run. Two nothing, Phillies. A little quiet here at Royal Stadium as Mike Schmidt hits his second home run of the series. In a roll reversal, it would now be the Royals trying to play catch up. They got one in the fifth and looked for more with the red hot Amos Otis up in the sixth. Breaking ball hit deep to left field. He hung a curveball. Lazinski is tied at two. The Royals would add on the go ahead run later in the inning. And when Quiz came on to get the last eight outs for the save, KC seemed destined for a home sweep. Dan Quisenberry walked out in the ninth inning to that mound, and the Kansas City Royals 
were going to win because Dan Quisenberry never blew a save. That's maybe what the traumatized faithful felt, but these Phillies had come too far and were too close to winning their first ever title, and they would show their resilience once again. Hot smash, Brett knocks it down. It's a base hit for Mike Schmidt, tying run is on. Nobody out, Del Unser is the pinch hitter. I can still see that ball that Del Unser hit. One strike pitch, hot smash, pass Aikens. Hopping in the right field. Schmidt can run, he's running hard. They're gonna try to score him, here comes the throw. They'll not get him, we're tied. And the way everything changed. Once the Phillies won that game, they were going home, and they were going to hand the ball to Steve Carlton, and Steve Carlton was not going to let them lose the World Series. I don't think I've ever gone into an important game feeling that the Phillies were going to win, but I had this feeling in that sixth game. What I remember was it was our time. We were back in Philadelphia. The fans wanted it, we wanted it, and Steve Carlton wanted it. Carlton was superb, allowing four hits and one run over seven innings. One ball, two strikes to Washington. And he really broke off a hard slider to get strikeout number seven. Meanwhile, it was also time for the Phillies' offensive leader to coronate his superb season when he had the chance to break the scoreless tie in the third. Base hit, right field. Here comes one run in. Smith is going to score Trailing 4-1 to one in the top of the ninth, the Royals loaded the bases against Tug McGraw. We had used Tug until he had nothing left, but there he was in that tight situation. The bases are loaded, the tying runs are on, and Frank White is the batter. I had all the faith in the world in Tug. I knew something good was going to happen. He had that type of personality where special things always happen. It's popped up. Baseball gods were looking after me then. Yes, sir, Reba. Rose was right there. It popped out of his glove, and Rose made the play. At that point, you figure, well, things are really going your way. Exactly. For the first time in 97 seasons, things went the way of the Phillies. At 11.29 p.m., October 21st, 1980, the ghosts of Phillies past are finally laid to rest. And because of that, the celebration was unforgettable. Why did this Philly team win it when others did not? They had heart, and I use the term character. Yeah. Character is a hard thing to explain yeah. unless you've been through what we've been through in September <laughs> in the playoffs and in the World Series. We're world champions. There's a lot of people in baseball didn't think we could be. Three years later, the Phillies returned to the World Series but it would be another quarter of a century before Philadelphia could celebrate another title. Phillies are world champions! Royals fans had only to wait five years for World Series glory, beating the 1985 Cardinals in seven games. The Kansas City Royals are the 1985 world champions. The iconic closers who anchored their respective teams in 1980 continued to amaze and entertain Tragically, Tug McGraw and Dan Quisenberry both succumbed to brain cancer. Quiz at the age of 45 in 1998, and Tug six years later at the age of 59. Mike Schmidt would become a three-time MVP, and George Brett, the only player ever to win batting titles in three different decades. Fittingly, both were first ballot Hall of Famers. It's truly the finishing touch on what was an extremely rewarding career.